Um, well, thank you all for being here. Um, I didn't know that C-SPAN would be here, so I thank C-SPAN for being here as well. I thought I would spend a little bit of time talking about the process, how this book was created. For those of you who've had an opportunity to either read the book or see some of the excerpts, there's been a couple out there now. Um, I thought I could walk you through a little bit of that because I seem to get a lot of questions about how and why these people would ever tell me some of the things they did. And then I thought I'd talk a little bit about the story and, and really, without ruining it, hopefully where the surprises are. And finally, a, a little bit about hopefully some of the lessons that have been learned, which was really more than anything the goal uh, when I started this project, which was I considered what happened over the past year in an odd way a mystery. Um, you know, you talked about it being a suspense thriller, and, and one of the hard things to do as an author is, uh, especially when you know the end of the story, um, how, how to construct something so that um, there's, there's enough surprises and new information and new twists and turns to, to really uh, engage the reader. Um, the book, for me, started, uh, like it probably did for many of you, on uh, September 15th, September 15th, 2008 was the Monday after Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy at 1.45 a.m. in the morning. Merrill Lynch had been sold to Bank of America, and AIG, I had just finished writing the front page story, was now teetering. It was the new domino that most of us had actually not been focused on at that time. And I got home, and it was about 2.30 in the morning, and I was excited is the wrong word. Freaked out is probably closer to the word. Um, and wanted to talk to somebody, anybody, about what had just happened. I couldn't even believe uh, what had happened. And I sort of had a, a front row seat for most of the weekend um, because I had been working the phones trying to figure out the story. And so, of course, the only person I could talk to uh, was someone who was sleeping, which was my wife, uh, whom I woke up and was un none too happy uh, to hear about any of this. I'm not sure that she thought it was that interesting or that she cared. Um, and I, 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 of course, to me, this was also dramatic. And I told her the whole story. And I said, you know, it's like a movie. And uh, she's a literary agent. And she sort of looked at me for half a second before rolling over. And she looked and said, no, it's like a book, Andrew. Um, and so that's how this all began. <laughs> And for the next week or two, I didn't really want to write a book. I'd never written more than, a, frankly, a couple thousand words uh, in the newspaper, um, maybe three or 4,000 words, and was very daunted by the idea of ever putting together um, as many chapters that are, as in this book. I Actually, when I started, don't be freaked out, by the way, by the size of the book. I know it's a little thick, but uh, that was not, not the ambition. It's thick paper, but it reads like Danielle Steele. <laughs> so, so for the next couple of weeks, I continued to be reporting for the New York Times, and the story took on a life of its own. It wasn't just a story about Lehman Brothers anymore or about AIG. It was about capitalism and socialism and government intervention and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and all of these other things happened. And at, I guess a week or two later, I started really thinking about the book and uh, Happily, in the midst of a crisis, I was, I guess, a vulture, if you will. I took advantage of the crisis and sold this book. And then spent an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out what the book could be. Um, for better or worse, I actually didn't really know when I started this. Except that I knew that there was a puzzle that needed to be put together. And that there was much more that it must have happened behind the scenes than, frankly, the headlines that, that, that I had been writing with others. And my goal, in a way, was to get behind the scenes and to tell this uh, almost as a human drama. Um, I've covered Wall Street for the past 10 years, and I thought of this, frankly, less about institutions in a way that were too big to fail, so much as I thought about it as people who, in their own way, thought they were too big to fail. And I wanted to tell that story from a, from a human perspective because I thought that so many of these people, I think from the outside, we, we think of them as infallible. And, and frankly, um, they're actually not, they may be wealthier, but they're not that different than, than the rest of the world. And then I spent an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out structure. People um, think about what's, how you structure a book, it's something I had not thought much about. And you, you know, people were doing books about Bear Stearns and about Lehman Brothers and all of these things, but to me it was really about the interconnectedness of all of these people that I knew. Um, 
and you had lawyers and bankers and people who were on all sides of these things, 20 ways and backwards, and it was how do you tell the, tell the story of all of these things, because in the end they were all connected. And I saw, or re-saw, a movie um, called Crash, if anybody knows that movie. And that is actually the model for the book, which is that you're really telling the story of three or four or five different plot lines, if you will, that are all seem to be happening somewhat independently of each other, but of course, they're not independent at all. And as the story progresses, they cataclysmically, in this case, come together. And that's the way I saw this. And I saw Lehman Brothers being one strand of the story, Dick Fold being, being part of it, a major protagonist as part of that strand. I saw the government, Hank, Tim, and Ben. Um, I now use them uh, all by first name. I know that probably uh, I shouldn't be doing that. Um, and, and then AIG being another strand, Merrill Lynch being another strand. And frankly, when I started, I didn't know where Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley would be. I didn't think they would be a huge component of the piece. But of course, they become a, a, their own storylines. And, and JP Morgan, oddly enough, ends up being the glue between many of these strands because of their involvement. They don't, I don't think they have their own plot line, per se, but you see them sort of pop up back, back and forth. And then I went about trying to get what ended up being over 200 people to sit with me. And in the end, they sat with me for over 500 hours to really try to reconstruct the record. And that was the goal of this project more than anything else, to get to understand where the, where the pivotal moments lay, where the meetings were, who was saying what to whom. And I started by um, doing only a handful of, handful of interviews, and I wanted to do it all on the record. And I sat there with my tape recorder, and it was not going very well, I must tell you. And people said, uh, and a, well, a person, a CEO said to me about three, three interviews into me, said, you know, Bob Woodward or Jim Stewart would never do it this way. Um, if you really are after, if you really want to know what I said to my wife, you, you know, I can't, I can't do this on the record. And so I actually switched in, in some ways sort of my approach, which was uh, to do this all on a, a, a sort of background basis so that everybody would have... Um, carte blanche, frankly, to tell me everything. Um, but if you were to ask me whether Hank Paulson participated in this book, I wouldn't tell you. And that's how uh, and why I think actually so many people did participate in this book. The other thing that was remarkable about the experience was just how much people told me and how, much, uh, how many pieces of notes they actually kept. That was something I did not expect. I didn't think that during this crisis, A, that they would have had time to keep notes, B, that in some cases some of them would be stupid enough to keep notes, um, and, and, and three, how many people were privy to so many of these conversations. And so one of the things uh, that happened actually very early on was I met with a CEO who, who sat down and he came with his notes from that fateful weekend at the Federal Reserve. And these notes, I will tell you, were better than any reporter's notes I'd ever seen in my life. Um, you know, he had Paulson, colon, quote. Um, he had actually drawn out contemporaneously at the time where everybody sat at the table. And I said to him, and at the end of the, at the, end of the meeting, I, I, he, he literally hands me the folder. He says, good luck. And I said, why are you giving me this stuff? And he said, for the same reason I, I took the notes. I thought, you know, this was history in the making. And so I think that for some people, I don't want to say all people, because um, there was a lot of spinning that went on later, and we'll get to that. But for some people, it was about reconstructing the historical record. And people felt, oddly enough, in that very moment that, that they were part of history. The other piece of it, um, which I didn't appreciate as a reporter, what, it, and I do this at the paper, but not in this way, is once you get to a certain point, there were, there were some people who didn't want to play at all, if you will, right? So I would call them up. They would say, I don't want, I'm not going to do an interview with you. This is crazy. Why would I ever do that? There becomes a moment where you can tell them, listen, I know you're at John Mack's house at 1030 in the morning on this specific Saturday morning. I know the five people who were there were these five people. I know that you were eating a chicken wrap sandwich at about noon and that your son called because he was late for the lacrosse game. And, and when you get to that point in the reporting process, those who are less inclined to participate 
uh, sometimes feel persuaded, uh, <laughs> if you will, that maybe it's a good idea. Of course, there was also this element of people who were trying to protect or, um, in some cases, rewrite their legacies. Um, people who wanted, who, who, re who recognized that maybe this book would work, and if it did, uh, it might have an impact on their legacies, and therefore um, wanted to spin or um, put, put their best foot forward, if you will. And I spent an inordinate amount of time trying to avoid letting those people do that. Um, I let them participate, obviously. But one of the, the great things was that by the end of the process, oddly enough, I almost had too, too much information. Um, it was like Rashomon in some ways. You'd, have, you, you'd talk to five or 10 people all from the same meeting, and they'd all give you their different memory of what happened. And I'd literally sit there with transcripts going through the various quotes and, you know, and trying to match the quotes and then going back to them almost in this sort of journalistic shuttle diplomacy, if you will, until everybody was in some agreement. And you'd sit there. And some of these interviews, of course, were actually quite tedious um, in that I would ask you horrible questions about, did you go left? Did you go right? What were you drinking? Um, were you finished with the drink? Did you? Uh, people remember odd details. I remember a guy saying he, suck, he kept sucking on the ice cubes. Um, so there are these little things, and you're sort of looking for this human element throughout to try to tell the story, and not only to tell the story of what's going on on the street or in Washington, but you know, when they get home, what do they say, and what are they thinking about? And so that, for me, that was the goal, to really, to really bring back the curtain um, and tell the story. The surprises to me, you know, when I started the project, as I said when I began, I didn't know whether I'd be able to tell you anything you had not read before. That's what I actually worried about the most. So much was coming out of the papers. Um, every day there was a new story, and so how were you going to tell this in a, in a compelling way? And I have to say I got very lucky in that people were much more open than I thought they'd be, and they started telling me things that actually changed the shape um, of the book, in fact. When I, when I did first start, even before the crash, a uh, sort of concept came to me. I was planning on doing this as really six or seven days in September. That was sort of actually my original uh, thought. And I, I started finding out, you know, I don't know if you remember, going into that fateful weekend, you kept hearing that Bear Stearns, I'm sorry, not Bear Stearns, Bank of America and Barclays were the two bidders and that they had shown up that weekend. Well, as you start peeling the onion back, you realize that that's not the case at all, that, that Barclays was actually approached in April by the US government behind the back of Dick Fold to take over the company. Um, you find out later that Bank of America didn't show up for the first time in September, but actually had a secret meeting uh, where Ken Lewis and Dick met with each other down at the New York Fed in July. You find out that the TARP plan, which we all think or thought was written in September, asking for $700 billion, uh, was very eerily written in a memo on April 15th and presented to Ben Bernanke. The memo was called Break the Glass, as in break the glass in case of an emergency. And so as I started peeling the story back, it became clear to me that the story actually was not about six days anymore. It was actually about much more, and it was a much longer period. And that's when the book, for those of you who have, hadn't had a chance to read it, starts the day after Bear Stearns is sold for $2 a share to J.P. Morgan. And I use that moment as sort of an inflection point, both on Wall Street and in Washington, in that it was clearly a, a major and important policy shift for, for Washington. It created this issue of moral hazard, a discussion that we had not been having in this country before. And it also put pressure on Lehman Brothers and the rest of the dominoes in ways that I'm not sure we even appreciated. You know, For me, the spring and the summer didn't feel that bad. I remember Lloyd Blankfein telling, telling people, I think in April, Lloyd Blankfein, CEO of Goldman Sachs, t telling people in April, that the worst was behind us. I actually remember Dick Fold saying the same thing. And so there was this, this almost sense of complacency during that period that nothing was happening. But behind the scenes, Hank Paulson is calling Warren Buffett, trying to put the arm on him back in March to make an investment in Lehman Brothers. 
And so I, I try to take you through this spring and summer period as you're marching into the fall. And what you, what you soon re realize is that a lot of these folks saw this train barreling down the track. Um, and everybody in their own way is trying to get out of the way. And of course, sadly, nobody gets out of the way fast enough. And there's this mad dash effort to create mergers for Lehman Brothers, um, to figure out what to do at AIG. Uh, there's, I don't want to ruin it, ruin it for you, but there's a meeting which uh, I, I had a reader actually stop me on the street the other day about uh, when Bob Willemstadt, uh, who's running AIG, literally goes to see Tim Geithner in August and says, you know, we're thinking maybe we want to become a primary dealer or bank holding company or something that might help us um, a month and a half before, of course, the cataclysm um, develops. Uh, by the way, Dick Fold makes the same plea in July. Of course, we now all know that uh, one of the ways that Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were saved was by turning them into bank holding companies. So it, it all comes in many ways full circle. And I think that hopefully when you get a chance to see, see how the, when you get to see the train barreling down the track, it may in, in, even in a way change your perception of, of the outcome. The other thing that was surprising to me that I never appreciated, and I don't know if people in the audience appreciate it any better than I did, was I remember when it felt like the world was about to fall off of its axis in those days when the market was tumbling. But I didn't really think it was going to affect the real economy. And so there is a moment, actually, two days after AIG, uh, I'm sorry, two days after Lehman, a day after AIG, in the, in the Treasury Department, um, in Hank's office, where he calls this an economic 9-11. And the conversation is no longer about Wall Street. It's actually about the next dominoes. And the next dominoes are Morgan Stanley, are Goldman Sachs. And we're talking, by the way, about these companies being wiped out by, in some of their estimations, by Monday. And the domino after that was actually the more interesting one, the one I had not been thinking about at all, which was General Electric. And this sense that this was really going to spill over in a very different way, that big and small companies were not going to be able to make payroll come next week. Um, you know, there were rumors that J.P. Morgan was no longer lending to Citigroup, that Bank of America was no longer lending uh, even even day-to-day even -day debt um, to McDonald's franchisees. I mean, that's what we were talking about in this sort of economic uh, apocalypse almost. And, and so really trying to bring the reader behind that so you can actually see it was, was, was the goal of the book. And I hope, I hope I've done some of that. The question that I get asked, and we, I hope we're going to talk about this in a minute, and I'll, I'll throw it open to questions in a second, is whether any lessons have been learned um, a year later. And I've now spent an inordinate amount of time with many of these people. And I will tell you, almost sadly, I'm not sure there has been many lessons learned at all. Um, I've said this on a couple of other broadcasts before. but. Many of the people who are still in charge now think of themselves and even call themselves survivors. It's the phrase they use. Um, and, and they use it in the same way that people describe cancer survivors. And I think that's actually a, a very misguided way to think about what happened because I think there's a lack of appreciation that in very many ways they were rescued by everyone in this room as taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And I think all of this, the crisis, uh, this story, hopefully, raises some fundamental questions about capitalism, which we have been exporting, exporting so successfully around the world, and, and what these firms and regulation, where the responsibilities are going to lie going forward. Because that's really the real question. For many years, um, we have done businesses operated all in the name of the shareholder, um, typically for very good reasons. But now there's a question of, A, who is the shareholder when you look at a Citigroup or a Bank of America? And B, can you do all of this in the name of the shareholder? And, and, and what happens when you put the rest of the system and the country at risk? And so I think those are sort of some fundamental questions that do get raised, hopefully as a result of the book. But I think that those are the questions that are going to be asked and be part of the national conversation for many more years. The last piece I'd leave you with before we start talking, um, hopefully with the group, is to talk a little about regulation. Um, 
are there steps that could have been taken to prevent this or to mitigate this? The answer that I, I frequently give is the seeds were sown 10 years ago. In fact, I would argue the seeds were sown before this book ever starts on March 17, 2008. Hank Paulson would probably argue to you that, in fact, as you're watching throughout this book, Dick Fold run around trying to make deals and everybody um, trying to do all of these things, that actually he was too late even then, that, that it was too far gone. Um, and so the question becomes, what were, what were those fundamental issues? And there's a number of flashbacks in the book that try to get at some of those issues. But I do think there's an argument to be made about Glass-Steagall, the combination of investment banks and commercial banks, whether you really want to have the casino attached to the, attached to the house, if you will. Um, there's, there are clearly questions about capital requirements. How much money does a bank need to keep in its coffers at any given time? What should the, the rainy day fund really look like? And, and that number had come down to a point where there really was no cushion. And I would argue today, when you hear about Wall Street bonuses or profits on the street, one of the things that I would hope we'd start thinking about is whether those profits and bonuses should be actually put back into the bank for the rainy day. Um, it, by the way, it cuts both ways by doing that, because if you don't think the banks are lending today, if you raise the requirement, they really won't be lending tomorrow either. So it's, it's a complicated uh, issue. The final thing, and I think we're starting to see this with the Barney Frank and um, Geithner proposals, is this idea of resolution authority, uh, which is the idea of being able to wind down an investment bank, hedge fund, insurance company, the Lehman's, AIG's, and frankly, long-term capitals of the world, in a orderly way. The bankruptcy code today is not a very good system for winding these companies down. And when you think about what happened to Lehman Brothers, it was more the code in a way than anything else, because it's what ended up creating this cataclysm. Uh, money got locked up, actually not in the United States, but in London, in the UK. And it wasn't just investors in the UK who had that money locked up, it was investors around the world. And part of the spiral downward that week was really a result more than anything else of the fact that this money was locked up and all of these investors started having to sell down all their other assets. And it turned into this vicious cycle and this fire sale. And so that becomes very, very important. And so to the extent that we can actually have um, resolution authority, which would be similar, by the way, to the um, the authority that the FDIC has for a commercial bank or the way um, the government took over Fannie and Freddie, which we can talk about as well. On that note, and I'm hoping we can talk about characters, we haven't really talked about the black hats and the white hats. There are very few heroes in this book as well. Um, some heroic moments. I thought I'd uh, open up to the floor to you. Thank you.